Uh, I have the honor and challenge of trying to introduce two of my favorite doctors at the same time today. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with Dr. Leary. Uh, he was kind enough to let me know that he was a National Merit Scholar in high school before getting his medical degree and doing his residency at John Hopkins, where he also was known as the most Oslerian intern. He came here for his uh, pulmonary fellowship and his, his MSI. He also uh, became an assistant professor this year in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. He's a renowned lecturer within the Department of Medicine and is on several national committees for pulmonary hypertension. And he's also published broadly on uh, both the mechanisms and outcomes of pulmonary hypertension in the literature. He's paired up with the esteemed Dr. Rao, who uh, got his undergraduate at UCLA, where he told me that he sat on the bench for the varsity men's basketball team. Freshman. <laughs> Um, he then went to Stanford for his medical degree before coming here for his residency and fellowship. He's currently an associate professor in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. He's also a former chief of staff and the first recipient of the Medical Chief Resident Teaching Awards, as well as the first recipient of the UWMC Patient Care Award. He, um, he's inside the hospital. He's on ICU steering committees and uh, was a former director of the Adult Critical Care Division here. He's published in a breadth of topics in pulmonary and critical care medicine uh, with a focus on pulmonary hypertension. He's also heavily evolved in education at all levels from medical school up to residency and uh, personally holds the record for highest attendance at Morning Report. Um, he and his wife Susan also hold the honor of having climbed all of the public stairs in the city of Seattle. Uh, I am a huge fan of both of these people and I'm really looking forward to hearing them speak. Dr. Rao. Thank you. I would mention that if you're interested, Google Seattle stairs, and you'll see pictures of all the stairs and various routes you can take. Uh, it's, it's a great experience. You see the, the entire city, places you've never seen before, and because there's stairs, there's lots of great views. So Peter and I are going to talk about pulmonary hypertension today. We last presented this about a dozen years ago uh, in this forum. I'm going to concentrate on the clinical aspects of the disease, the treatment, and Peter, then in the second half, assuming that I stop on time, uh, will talk about some research developments locally, nationally, internationally, uh, in terms of ideas about pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to state from the top that pulmonary hypertension, although it starts as a disease in the pulmonary arterioles, really the course of it is dependent on the progression of that disease, but it's also very much dependent on how well the right heart handles the high afterload that results. These are our disclosures. 1001, 1002, okay. Uh, back when we previously presented this, 2001 or so, I would have presented you a classic patient. 32-year-old woman, woman of childbearing age, with progressive exertional dyspnea, doesn't have any other health problems, and had a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 100. Uh, for those of you who don't deal with this every day, your pressure, pulmonary artery systolic pressure is right now are probably around 25. So this is four times normal. So on the systemic side, this would be a blood pressure of 500. This is a patient we saw last week in clinic. Current kind of patients we see. Older than 32, male, who also has progressive exertional dyspnea. With a background of hereditary spherocytosis, Snoring, maybe he has sleep apnea, we don't know yet. Previous pulmonary embolism, we don't know if that resolved or if it's chronic. And a pulmonary artery pressure of 90 that seems way out of proportion to these risk factors. So does he have multifactorial disease? Does he actually have what we used to call primary pulmonary hypertension? Trying to figure out what the mixture is here. So we're getting a lot of, of much more, at least intellectually complicated patients. To get you through the definitions, uh, this is not nice definition. This is Nice from Nice, France, where the last uh, conference was held. It, if we just use the term pulmonary hypertension, that means the mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25. Normal is 10, 15, upper limit of normal is 20. We give it up to 25 to make sure it's real. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH, takes that but adds in a normal wedge pressure so we don't have left sided heart disease and enough resistance to get your pulmonary vascular resistance over three wood units. A normal pulmonary vascular resistance is one, one to two wood units. I'm gonna show you two pathology slides. 
This is a pulmonary arteriole with its adventitia, media, intima, and a lot of space for the blood to go through. It's about a 200 micron vessel. Actually, this vessel is abnormal. So even though it appears to have a big lumen, relatively thin coat, this media adventitia is about twice the thickness of normal. If we have a patient who presents with this kind of pathology, we have a pretty good chance of helping them. But if we have a more end-stage pathology with huge onion skinning, medial hypertrophy, intimal thickening, and you're left with a very small lumen, then we got a lot more problems with trying, with trying to treat the patient. Most patients may have lesions in various stages within one time. For a model of what normally happens to the pulmonary artery pressures as your pulmonary blood flow increases, you can look at a normal person who at rest may have a cardiac output of five liters per minute with extreme exercise may go fourfold higher up to 20 liters per minute, but their pulmonary artery pressure hardly increases at all due to compensatory recruitment and other mechanisms within the lung. Or if you start with some degree of pulmonary hypertension, your pressure goes up much faster. And if you start with severe pulmonary hypertension, it goes up even faster. There will be some threshold here at which your RV starts to fail or you become symptomatic. So resting pressure is what we're normally dealing with. But for the patients, what kind of pressures they get with exertion are very important. And their limited cardiac output limits their exertion. This is going to illustrate the progression of the disease. As the pathology progresses with more and more vascular narrowing, what happens with the hemodynamics, the lines, and the clinical status? So here you progress from stage one, New York Heart Association symptoms, up to stage four. Initially, early on, your pulmonary vascular resistance starts to go up as the vessels narrow. Your pulmonary artery pressures go up as well. Your right heart usually is able to keep up a decent cardiac output for a period of time. And since the symptoms are mostly related to cardiac output and not the pressure, patients tend to be asymptomatic during this phase. However, as your disease progresses, eventually your, cardi your right heart can't keep up with the cardiac output, especially at exercise, and your cardiac output starts to fall. You become more and more symptomatic. Your BNP starts to go up, and eventually, your right heart can't keep up the pressures and your pulmonary artery pressure starts to fall. So if we have two serial echoes on a patient and the pulmonary artery pressure has decreased, that may be because we made them better with medications or it may be because they've got progressive disease. For many years, we've had a five group classification of pulmonary hypertension. I'm gonna pay most attention today to pulmonary arterial hypertension group one. Group two is pulmonary venous hypertension, secondarily to left heart disease. Group three is a variety of advanced lung disease or hypoxic disorders. Group four, chronic pulmonary thromboembolism. Group five, a miscellaneous group with other causes. There's gonna be a little something for every generalist and specialist in these diagnoses. I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this slide, pulmonary arterial hypertension group one. We used to call, use the term primary pulmonary hypertension. That term has been abandoned. That used to contain the idiopathic, no obvious etiology patients like the 32-year-old woman I mentioned. And we found out more and more about heritable disease in the last decade. Initially, it was thought that about 6% of pulmonary arterial hypertension was familial. We've learned through various gene studies that actually about half of patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension have one of these genetic abnormalities. The penetrance of the disease, however, is only about 15, 20%. And that's why you often don't pick it up on a family history. BMPR2, bone morphogenic protein receptor 2, was the first receptor and is the major abnormal receptor in heritable disease. Um, these are all involved somehow in vascular proliferation regulation. Interestingly, ALK1 and endoglin are also abnormal in a quite different pulmonary vascular disease, which is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where instead of vascular narrowing, 
you get vascular dilation. So abnormalities in those can take you either way. Drugs and toxins. A number of drugs and toxins are associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension, many of them illegal. Connective tissue disease. This is mainly systemic sclerosis and mainly limited systemic sclerosis crest syndrome, where 50% or more of patients will eventually develop pulmonary hypertension. So this is a group of patients that get yearly monitoring for the development of pulmonary hypertension in an attempt to diagnose it early. Mixed connective tissue disease, also quite common. The other collagen vascular disorders like lupus, pulmonary hypertension does occur, but it's much, much less frequent. HIV. Interestingly, with HIV, you can get pulmonary hypertension at any stage of the disease. So you can have just positive HIV, nothing else, and still get pulmonary hypertension. It happens in about a half a percent of patients with HIV. Portal hypertension. At this hospital, since we deal with a lot of end-stage liver disease, we see a lot of cirrhosis. It's really the pulmonary hypertension that's the association with pulmonary hypertension. There are models in which you can feed animals various substances and get this. If you have significant pulmonary hypertension, it's a contraindication to liver transplant because with the stresses of the transplant, you will die on the table. So we have to get those patients treated where they may qualify for a liver transplant. And that's about 10% of end-stage liver disease. Oh, congenital heart disease. Um, when Karen and Eric send us patients with complex congenital heart disease, we spend about the first hour just trying to figure out what the plumbing is. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> Eisenmengers, as part of uh, con congenital heart disease, most commonly due to a VSD, you initially have left to right flow from the VSD, but that high flow, probably through shear force uh, irritation to the pulmonary vasculature, causes those pulmonary vascular lesions we saw before. You get reversible of the flow and a right to left shot. For the ID docs, schistosomiasis worldwide is a major cause of pulmonary hypertension. There are then a couple of classes that kind of get thrown in here because they don't kind of don't fit. Pulmonary venoocclusive disease, and perhaps its worst form, pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, are disorders where the primary lesions are on the pulmonary venous side with secondary lesions on the pulmonary arterial side. Because of those lesions on the venous side, these patients can get pulmonary edema, which is not a function of the other causes of pulmonary hypertension. With pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, the overgrowth is so marked that you can actually see little dots on a chest X-ray, what are called tumorlets. And then there's a newborn persistence. Natural history of this disease, the classic primary pulmonary hypertension, Terrible disease, 50% mortality at two and a half years. And this was mostly young people. Breakdown of the diseases I already showed you. This is from a uh, French registry. Idiopathic, most commonly familial, a lot of connective tissue disease, fairly equal portions of congenital heart disease, portopulmonary, drug-induced, lesser numbers of HIV. These are some of the drugs that have been reasonably well studied. The bad actors, Minorex in Europe in the 60s, Benfluramine, this was Fenfen, Redox, Benflurex is a European drug. These are all weight loss medicine, all with similar structures. They all cause pulmonary hypertension. SSRIs in a pregnant woman have been associated with pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. Likely drugs. Uh, Methamphetamines, I would put methamphetamines in the definite column. Got a lot of meth users. Among the unlikely drugs, fortunately, oral contraceptives and estrogens uh, are not in that category. Uh, birth control is extremely important in these patients as there's a high maternal mortality. This is one of the inherited lesions. This is the bone morphogenic protein, which works through a receptor type 2 and type 1. It's usually the type 2 that is altered. Normally works through a kinase followed by phosphorylation, involvement of SMADs, goes down to the nucleus and makes various transcription factors that lead to 
stimulate vascular overgrowth in the pulmonary vessels or delay apoptosis, either one of which will give you extravascular growth. So we think about pulmonary hypertension this way as involving both genetic changes and a variety of these and other and unknown insults that occur in the environment. In a genetically non septile individual, with time it may take several hits. In a genetically susceptible individual, it may take just a few hits to start this process off. But again, the penetrance for the BMPR2 for pulmonary hypertension is only about 15, 20 percent. I'm going to briefly mention the other groups. Group 2 is pH from pulmonary from left heart disease. We're seeing more and more, quote, diastolic dysfunction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And these patients are a real bugaboo because we don't have any great therapies for them. Among the lung diseases, basically any bad end-stage lung disease can be associated with pulmonary hypertension. Usually, from our point of view, it's not super bad pulmonary hypertension, although there are outliers who have pulmonary artery pressures of 100 in this group. I put a space between this and these disorders because these all work through alveolar hypoxemia. Every time any of us go to altitude, we immediately get spasm of our pulmonary arterioles. If you have 24 hour a day alveolar hypoxemia, you've got spasm 24 hours a day and that can lead to obstructive lesions I showed you before. I always mention that sleep disorder breathing by itself, sleep apnea, usually does not cause anything more than mild pulmonary hypertension. That you need 24-hour-a-day hypoxemia to really develop this. Group 4, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Again, about 3% of acute pulmonary emboli never resolve completely. And 50% of patients who appear with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension never have a history of an acute pulmonary embolism. So we need to exclude this diagnosis on all patients. It's generally felt, actually, that a VQ scan is better than a CT scan for that. David Godwin, no comments. OK. <laughs> group 5 is the miscellaneous group. For the hematologist, it includes hemolytic anemias, especially sickle cell. Um, that's supposed to be splenectomy. Why that causes pulmonary hypertension, we don't know. A uh, group of additional pulmonary disorders. Uh, glycogen storage diseases, hyperthyroidism we always think about, and then fibrosing metastinus, mediastinitis for the kidney doctors, CKD for a variety of mechanisms. This is a sample um, that Mike Mulligan took out of a patient when he did a pulmonary end arterectomy. This is not just taking out clock. This is going, dissecting down to the media and dissecting out chronic clot and fibrosis to smaller and smaller vessels as far as you can get out. Major operation, but superb operation. 95% of patients have at least a New York Heart Association one class improvement, and the majority have at least two classes improvement. Okay? And our drugs aren't very good for this. Okay, the clinical presentation of these patients Exertional dyspnea, exertional dyspnea, exertional dyspnea. Don, I think you said once that if you could only ask your patients one question in terms of pre-op evaluation, you'd ask them about their exertional dyspnea. Am I quoting properly? Okay. Now, the problem is people think, oh, I'm getting old, I should stop smoking, I need to lose weight, et cetera. And so they don't report for at least six months to a year after they start to develop symptoms. We grade their symptoms in four classes. These patients are picked up. Incidentally, these patients have mild symptoms with normal activity. We start getting really worried when we hear class three, class four symptoms. The corresponding, we do a lot of six minute walk distances. And one thing people don't realize, a normal walk here of 600 meters, 2,000 feet in six minutes, that's four miles an hour. Okay, so that's a brisk walking pace that people in this room can do. You go down to three miles an hour, you're probably in class two. Go down to two miles an hour where you're not moving very fast at all, you're probably in class three. And class four patients can barely do one mile an hour. So we use this to monitor severity and response to treatment. 
the radiology signs, one of the reasons the diagnosis is delayed is the radiology signs are fairly subtle. The heart generally isn't hugely enlarged. The right atrium may poke out a little bit. What you're really looking for is the size of the pulmonary arteries. The descending pulmonary artery here on the right and the main and left pulmonary arteries over here. So it's often not a striking chest x-ray at all. It can easily be missed. Peter will later show you a dynamic view of echocardiograms. This is where the diagnosis is usually made. So the diagnosis is usually made by a physician concerned enough that there's something going on causing the exertional dyspnea that they get an echo. We calculate pulmonary artery pressure, estimate it from the velocity of the tricuspid regurgitation jet. We look at chamber size, there's a big RV, big RA, and evaluate cardiac function. So this is an absolutely key test for anybody with exertional dyspnea of any cause. We always cardiac cath these patients, right heart cath, confirm the pressures exactly, to look for a step up to exclude left to right shunts, to measure the wedge pressure to make sure it's not a class two disorder, maybe the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. Sometimes we volume load patients to try to stress the left heart. Measuring cardiac output is very important because that's a major prognostic sign. From these numbers, we can calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance. And with this disease, you can get pulmonary vascular resistance of 24, 24 times normal. Just huge, huge increases in pulmonary vascular resistance. If you've got a good right heart, you can partially keep up with that. And we test vasodilator therapy. We think of the right ventricle like we think of the left ventricle. You've got afterload, various causes of afterload, including high afterload, including pulmonary hypertension. You've got contractility. With pulmonary hypertension, you eventually develop secondary problems with contractility. And then you've got your preload. So you manipulate that. There's always a big concern about getting the preload too low because that will drop the cardiac output. I think I've only managed to do that about three times in my career. Usually the problem is too much preload. I'm not going to go a lot into mechanisms, but this is a slide of some of the mechanisms that are being studied. Out here, the yellow, we have various circulating mediators. We have cell surface receptors. We have intracellular substances that eventually get down to the nucleus and change transcription factors decreasing apoptosis, increasing relative phenotypes. In terms of treatment, we have three major treatment pathways, the endothelin, the nitric oxide, and the prostacycline pathways. With the endothelin pathway, you have a circulating endothelin 1. It reacts with 2, an A and a B receptor. That stimulation causes vasoconstriction and proliferation of the pulmonary vessels. So we want to block this. With the nitric oxide pathway, nitric oxide comes from, from the conversion of arginine to citrulline and stimulates CMP, which causes vasodilation. We manipulate this pathway with phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, which are basically Viagra and Cialis. Prostacycline pathway, rachidonic acid, the final end product of rachidonic acid metabolism is prostaglandin I1, which is prostacycline, it works through stimulating cyclic AMP pathways to cause vasodilation. So we manipulate those pathways. When I gave this talk several years ago, our options were transplant the patient, use calcium channel blockers, which only work in 5 to 10 percent of patients in very high doses, or IV epoprostanol had been, de had been developed by that point. So for a mere $175,000 a year, you can treat your patient. It remains, actually, our most potent therapy. And the patient who comes to us in stage four or is slipping towards stage four will get put on IV therapy. Ocentin was the first of a class that now includes ambrosentin and masotentin, of endothelium receptor antagonists. It's a pill you take once or twice a day, and it only costs $75,000 a year. These prices are, in my mind, obscene. The other forms of prostacyclines, troprostanol, inhaled iloprost, inhaled troprostanol, and now, most recently, oral troprostanol, have all been developed. They all are not inexpensive. 
recently a new class has come on the market, Rhea Sigurat, you may have read, it, read about this in the New England Journal. It's been studied with thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension as well as class one pulmonary hypertension. Works through stimulating soluble uh, glomocyclase. So our general treatment algorithm, this is much simplified, is to use diuretics, oxygen, and anticoagulation. Check for an acute violator vasodilator response in the cath lab. If they have a response, and again, this is only 5, 10% of patients, who have a good response, then you can treat them with calcium channel blocker, or blockers in high doses. 50% of those patients who initially respond will progress eventually, but we've got patients who've been on calcium channel blockers for over 30 years. If they don't have an acute vasodilator response, paradoxically, do you treat them with vasodilators? If they're class two or an early class three, and a few in receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, we don't know which to use first. Or reosiguat, a new medication. If they start to deteriorate, go to prostacyclines. Class four patients immediately go to IV prostacyclines. If they deteriorate further, you use combinations of these, which gets super expensive. The indication for lung transplantation, which we do maybe four or five times a year now, is failure of maximum therapy. An atrial septostomy, send them to Steve Goldberg. He punches a hole between the atria. That serves as a pop-off valve, which makes it easier on the right ventricle. Also makes patients quite hypoxemic. Just a typical study of uh, medication for approval. The FDA based approval of these drugs on short-term studies, 12 to 16 weeks. So we don't have good, controlled, long-term studies on most of these medications. <clears throat> they looked at the six-minute walk and said, okay, if your six-minute walk significantly improves, we'll, we'll approve your drug. This was, sorry, I've got a jillion curves like this. This one was for the sildenafil study. <clears throat> and the placebo group didn't improve at all over those 12 weeks. The sildenafil groups all improved by about 40 meters and walk 40 meters further. Well, that's highly, highly statistically significant. Problem is, the baseline here was 300 meters. So they're actually going from 300 meters to 340 meters, 10, 12% improvement. So these are not knock your socks off improvements. They're significant. They definitely benefit patients. Patients live longer with therapy, but therapies are much weaker than I would like to have. This is one of a number of survival curves with intravenous epoprosnol. This only goes out to three years, but this was the untreated course of patients. This is with IV epoprosnol. So we clearly can extend people's lives. We've had patients who are stable on IV epoprosnol for greater than 12 years now, 24 hours a day. What's in the future? Peter's going to talk more about this. We have, we're looking at trying to modulate in several mechanisms. Still looking at vasodilators like we have now, other means of getting nitric oxide into people or nitrates. Sympathetic nervous system, Peter will talk more about this. Beta blockade. Then an angiotensin system. Heck, the cardiologists do it for left heart disease, so why shouldn't we do it for right heart disease? By the way, the right heart and left heart have separate embryological origins. Okay, so they're not exactly the same. Um, these patients have, in terms of their vascular remodeling, have metabolic alterations, including glycolytic pathways. Maybe we can manipulate those. There is inflammation, although you usually don't see much of it on a routine biopsy. And so the tuximab, of course, which is, treats everything these days, is used experimentally, and rokinase inhibitors. People are looking at multi-kinase inhibition. They're looking at various genes and cell therapies. And just like the cardiologists, looking at devices, right ventricular support devices, cardiac resynchronization. So there's a number of, number of things being looked at out there. Uh, one of the difficulties of looking at these is this still is a un quite uncommon disorder, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it's hard to get enough patients. We really need to form national consortiums to study these. 
Okay, so while Peter's coming up, everybody go out. And uh, Peter altered this slide appropriately. <laughs> Okay, so I like to identify my non sequiturs, and I will say that while I think we can all maybe have a healthy conversation about whether or not soda pop, popcorn, and hot dogs are healthy snacks, um, we can all agree that cigarettes, in fact, are not. Um, so as we shift our conversation over to future directions and research in pulmonary arterial hypertension, I want to give you a sense of the structure that we have moving forward. Essentially, I've identified three clinical paradigms, things that Dave and I think about as we look at our patients on a regular basis, and then identify ways in which we may move the ball down the court, improve the care of our patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension using these existing clinical paradigms. So the first is, as Dave walked you through, pulmonary hypertension is not one disease. It is many diseases. And by more effectively identifying and targeting our therapies, we may get a lot more mileage out of the medicines that we've already developed. The second is that increased right heart afterload is the hallmark of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Thinking about right heart afterload in novel ways and finding novel ways to reduce right heart afterload are going to be keys toward moving the ball down the court as well. And finally, as Dave highlighted, while right heart afterload increases are the hallmark of pulmonary hypertension, this is a disease of heart failure. Uh, and it is really the coupling, or rather I should say the uncoupling, of right ventricular function and pulmonary vascular resistance that leads to the symptoms in this disease. Focusing on the right heart and ways that we can improve its strength and function may get a lot of mileage in the care of patients with pulmonary hypertension. So you've now gotten the take-home points. In the event of flood or other natural disaster, uh, you, can, you can rest assured that you've gotten the meat of this part of the talk. So I want to start out with a little bit of the State of the Union. Dave showed a slide showing the change in survival, um, and I just want to highlight that numerically. <laughs> So the top row here is historical controls. This was a cohort at the NIH assembled between 1981 and 1985. Uh, and as you can see, and really as any patient that you mention the words pulmonary hypertension will see when they Google this disease, the five-year survival was dismal, 34%. So as we look at some of the drugs that are available now, and there are others as well, I want to highlight two points. One may quibble about what these numbers, numbers actually are, um, and there's some methodologic concerns in this comparison. But on balance, I think we can rest assured that we have improved survival in this disease, maybe as much as doubling the survival compared to the early 80s. There's been a lot of progress. But I think equally apparent with a five-year survival of 60% in what are oftentimes fairly young patients, we still have a lot of room to go. There are a lot of improvements that remain to be made in the care of patients with this disease. And some of those may go back to extensions of our current paradigms. The first of which, as I said, is that pulmonary hypertension is not one disease, but many diseases. And more effectively, identifying these diseases and targeting our existing drugs may help in the care of these patients. So first, I want to really reinforce the heterogeneity of patients with high pulmonary pressures. So group one disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension, oftentimes what we're all thinking about when we see a high pulmonary pressure. That's a disease of pulmonary vascular narrowing and increased resistance. Our drugs don't lower pulmonary pressures. Our drugs lower pulmonary vascular resistance in patients that have narrowed vessels. Group 2 disease, left heart disease, may not be a problem of narrowing in pulmonary vascular resistance. It may be a problem of pulmonary vascular compliance. It may explain why our drugs don't work as well, and sometimes are even harmful in this disease. 
Group 3 disease, things like COPD, may be disruption of the pulmonary vasculature. Again, not narrowing. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. And here's the rub. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, group 1 disease, where we have all of our medications, is a diminishingly small fraction of patients with high right heart afterload, of patients with high pulmonary pressures. This is the Almadale cohort in Western Australia, a town of about 150,000 people. They decided over about five years to collect the echocardiograms on every patient that had one. They did about 10,000 echoes. About 960 of them showed high pulmonary pressures. Pretty common. About 9% of their echoes had elevated pulmonary pressures. They went back and tried to identify the cause of that pulmonary hypertension. The vast majority was left heart disease both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. And even if we generously put a lot of the unknowns into the pulmonary arterial hypertension category, it's still a distinct minority. And so it begs the question, can patients, which are the majority of patients with high pulmonary pressures, with non-group 1 disease be treated with therapies for pulmonary arterial hypertension? And as I stand here right now, the answer to that question is by and large, no. It's been studied, it's been looked at. These therapies typically don't work. Uh, sometimes they're even harmful. There are caveats to this. Single drugs and single diseases within these other groups where there may be some benefit, but maybe not in the same way that we're thinking about pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so that means the majority of patients that come in with high right heart afterload, we don't have something to offer them. And that's frustrating. Um, the NIH is sponsored at the cost of many millions of dollars, uh, a project which is getting started, a multi-center U01 called PVD Omics, um, where instead of focusing on one World Health Organization group, they're going to try and enroll 1,500 participants in a prospective cohort with all five World Health Organization groups. And then they're really going to put them through the ringer. They're going to do genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, dynamic phenotyping. You know, they're going to try and analyze these participants six ways to Sunday. And at the end of that, they have a lot of goals. But one of the goals is to try and see whether or not there are identifiable groups of patients in these other World Health Organization groups who maybe have a disease that we would think of as pulmonary arterial hypertension, but happen to have emphysema, but happen to have heart failure of reduced ejection fraction, to see whether or not there are subsets for whom our existing therapies uh, can be targeted and improve the, the care of these patients. So that's one extension. The other source of heterogeneity is within group one disease. So, most of the therapies that have been created for pulmonary arterial hypertension were studied in patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension and then extrapolated to other groups who had similar histology, similar findings in terms of pulmonary vascular narrowing. Those patients with connective tissue disease, HIV, portal hypertension, who also get pulmonary arterial hypertension. They haven't been well studied in those groups. It's a rare disease. We don't know whether or not there are populations that benefit more or less from these drugs. And so there is reason to believe that there probably is heterogeneity in treatment response. This is a paper by Steve Mathai uh, at Hopkins who looked at the response to Tadalafil as a function of being a man or a woman. And he found that Men who got Tadalafil on top of background therapy, in this case it was mostly Bocentin, had a pretty good benefit. 63% of them improved their six-minute walk distance, a minimally important amount, as opposed to 43% who were just on Bocentin. Women, on the other hand, didn't seem to fare so well. So there may be differences, there may be better targeting of our drugs, even within pulmonary arterial hypertension, and one of the ways that we're hoping to get at this is that the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, within the last six months, has started accrediting pulmonary hypertension centers. There are probably about 35 to 50 centers in the U.S. that have the right volume and expertise to be centers for comprehensive care. Um, 
And part of being accredited is participating in the Pulmonary Hypertension National Patient Registry. So the idea of this registry, which is housed and run by Dick Cronmall's group uh, here at the University of Washington, is to really understand and create a platform for comparative effectiveness research, comparative outcomes. We're collecting demographics, etiology of their pulmonary arterial hypertension, as well as outcomes. Uh, and so I think that this will be a powerful tool moving forward to try and get at some of these questions. Things as basic and rudimentary as which drug should we start with um, that really isn't known that well and is different from center to center. So the second point that I want to make, I hope I've made the point that improving targeting finding novel patient populations may make better use of the drugs we already have to care for patients with high right heart afterload. The other of which is to think about right heart afterload and whether there are other ways to bring it down. So right heart afterload we typically have thought of as pulmonary vascular resistance. The narrowed blood vessels just make sense that you can't squeeze more blood through the lungs. In reality, right heart afterload is probably a combination of two factors. Certainly pulmonary vascular resistance. That resistance to static blood flow going through the lung. But also pulmonary vascular compliance. That resistance to pulsatile blood flow through the lungs. Each time your heart beats, it sends an aliquot of blood out into the pulmonary vasculature. A, poorly, a, a highly compliant pulmonary, pulmonary vasculature accepts that aliquot of blood without raising its pressure much at all. A very poorly compliant pulmonary vasculature, the pressure goes way up with each aliquot of blood. And what Ryan Tedford also at Hopkins showed is that the relationship between pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular compliance is pretty tight. When your pulmonary vascular resistance gets worse, your pulmonary vascular compliance is typically worse as well. In patients that have a better pulmonary vascular compliance, their pulmonary vascular resistance is better as well. And so we don't think about pulmonary vascular resistance, that narrowing that we saw the histology of, as being something that's rapidly reversible. Pulmonary vascular compliance may tell a different story. So, this is work by uh, Carolina Masri in the Division of Cardiology here at UW. Uh, and I'll give disclosure and say these are left heart failure patients. But I think that the lessons learned from this are instructive. She looked at hemodynamics in patients with left heart failure before, after, and a while after the placement of an LVAD. So after they receive mechanical circulatory support. And what she found is that, as hoped and expected, within 48 hours, the wedge pressure came down. And that improvement was sustained at more than 30 days, maybe even a little bit better. So the wedge pressure came down quickly. What does the wedge pressure do to the pulmonary vasculature? A high wedge pressure over-distends the pulmonary vessels. An over-distended vessel is a poorly compliant vessel. And when you remove the over-distension of that vessel, you say, well, we're probably going to improve pulmonary vascular compliance. Happily, that's what she saw, that within 48 hours, the pulmonary vascular compliance improved markedly. Now, the last panel on this figure shouldn't be a surprise if you were paying attention to the previous slide, um, but I think is also very instructive. The pulmonary vascular resistance also markedly dropped within 48 hours. I don't think anyone in the room would suggest that putting an LVAD in reversed the pulmonary vascular remodeling in 48 hours. And so the fact that we were able to change compliance dramatically by unloading the pulmonary vasculature probably moved it along that pulmonary vascular resistance and compliance curve and moved these patients from a level where we would call them as having WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension to not having WHO group 2 pulmonary hypertension. Within 48 hours, and that was a change that was sustained at greater than 30 days. So taking this a little bit further into pulmonary arterial hypertension, 
Um, there is a group uh, in China that was led by an interventional cardiologist in New York, actually, um, that looked at what they think is pulmonary artery denervation. So this is an idea that they've been thinking about in the renal arteries. Essentially, electrocautery of the renal artery um, leads to denervation and treats systemic hypertension. And they decided to try this in the pulmonary vasculature as well. Using an interventional catheter-based approach, they put electrocautery leads in, uh, and they scorch the pulmonary artery um, with the idea that the nerves, which run right along that vascular bundle, uh, are also going to be damaged or destroyed and die off distally, thereby maybe removing some tone, improving compliance. So what they found is only 13 participants. So uh, I think that we have to be a little bit cautious before we get super excited, but it was interesting. These were sick people. Their pulmonary vascular resistance was sky high, 23. Their mean PA pressure was up at 55. Probably would have been even higher if their cardiac output wasn't in the gutter. Their BNP was more than 2,000. Their New York Heart Association functional class was between three and four. They had severe symptoms. Most were on, all were on at least one pulmonary vasodilator. Some were on, most were on two. They were on diuretics, they were on oxygen. They took them in cauterized their pulmonary artery, um, and then stopped all of their pulmonary vasodilators at the same time. I would argue that that was gutsy, um, <laughs> but it does make this a cleaner study. Um, so within about 24 hours, the pulmonary vascular resistance had dropped to 14. The mean PA pressure had dropped to 39. The BNP had dropped to 1,500. They brought all these people back three months later. And what did they find? The pulmonary vascular resistance had continued to fall. It was down at nine. The mean PA pressure was probably about the same. The cardiac output had actually picked up. Um, the BNP was almost a third of where it was when it had started. And now their New York Heart Association functional class was between one and two, really mild symptoms. So what I hope I've shown here is that thinking about right heart afterload as a function of both compliance and resistance may have dividends, and that there are novel ideas in the pipeline for how to lower right heart afterload. But coming back to one of the core principles, pulmonary arterial hypertension is a disease of heart failure. And so one way may be to decrease right heart afterload, but ignoring the right heart in this equation is probably a mistake. Um, so here you see the failing right heart of a pulmonary hypertension patient. On the bottom here, these are 3D reconstruction from Dr. Sheehan's lab here at the University of Washington. You can see a normal heart there in the bottom right-hand corner. Nice big football-shaped left ventricle, a right ventricle that kind of curves around the edge and is somewhat thin. In pulmonary hypertension, that right ventricle has dilated. It's pushing in on the left ventricle. It's made it into a little pancake. Um, and the combination of an overdistended right ventricle and a compressed left ventricle lead to a whole world of problems in this disease. Now, this is an extremely instructive case report that Stu Rich in Chicago uh, put forward a couple years ago. In the left here is a patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension who came in, got started on medications, and died in about four years of right heart failure. On the right is another young woman with about the same pulmonary vascular resistance who came in in an era really where there weren't as many of the same medications even, but got started on what was available and lived for 22 years before dying of colon cancer with really relatively mild symptoms throughout. And I hope the difference is apparent. Her right ventricle for all the world looks like her left ventricle. Over time, her right ventricle or hypertrophied, became more muscular. It stayed coupled with the pulmonary vascular resistance and was able to keep doing its job, even in the setting of what, close to her demise, was a pulmonary vascular resistance of about 14. Um, we know that this happens. We see this happen. We don't know why this happens. And if there are ways that we can make more people look like the woman whose right ventricle hypertrophied, we may have inroads and, and other avenues to offer our patients. So right now, 
we don't have any therapies targeting the right heart. Sure, we do heart failure stuff. We diurese them, we tell them not to eat salt, we tell them to weigh themselves every day. Um, but we don't use any medications analogous to left heart failure targeting the neurohormonal axis or any of those things. And I think there are probably three ways to move forward in this regard. One of which is to do the Me Too studies, to learn the lessons from left heart failure. We start a lot of our grant applications with the line, we need to study the right ventricle because it has a distinct embryology, a distinct fiber orientation, a distinct afterload, um, in order to compel people to have us study the right ventricle. But maybe there's more we can learn from the left ventricle than we let on. So beta blockers, were and are in current guidelines still relatively contraindicated in pulmonary hypertension. Why is that? There was one study of patients with portopulmonary hypertension who were on beta blockers for variceal prophylaxis, and when they were stopped, there was a short-term improvement in their six-minute walk distance. I think one can argue that the left heart failure patient on beta blockers that are stopped may have a short-term improvement in their functional status but that's more than offset by the long-term benefits of these medicines. So pulmonary hypertension as a field is coming back around to these ideas that have already been established in left heart failure. There's a randomized controlled trial in the Netherlands that's ongoing right now. Uh, and this is some work in the US which looked at carvedilol. This was a case series essentially um, because it was not controlled, not placebo controlled. They feel that they established that carvedilol was safe over the course of about six months. They wanna make the case that it's effective uh, and I think that's certainly tantalizing from the improvements that they show here, uh, but far from established. So one avenue is to borrow lessons from left heart failure. The other of which is to establish new paradigms in heart failure and then bring these back to patients with pulmonary hypertension and isolated right heart failure. So this is work that we did in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, uh, where we looked at the use of H2 blockers and incident heart failure and found that participants who used H2 blockers had about a 60% reduction in the risk of incident heart failure over 10 years of follow-up. We can all think of a lot of ways that something like this might be confounded, but it was pretty robust to a variety of adjustments and joins literature that including a small randomized controlled trial in heart failure patients showing that H2 blockers improve symptoms and joins animal work showing that reactivation of the H2 receptor may be very important and, in fact, even necessary for myocardial fibrosis in response to stress. So identifying novel paradigms for heart failure, doing the good work that everybody's already doing, and then testing these in right heart failure is another way that we can move the ball down the court. Finally, is looking at right heart adaptation in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, and this is a study that we're doing at the University of Washington right now the Seattle Right Ventricle Translational Science Study, which is a somewhat cumbersome way to get at the acronym CERVATUS. Um, so Miguel Cervetus, uh, handsomely pictured at the bottom of the slide, was the first European to describe the pulmonary circulation. Um, unfortunately, he was burned at the stake with all but three copies of this description, uh, which is a fate that most pulmonary hypertension researchers hope not to share. So the aim of this study is to understand determinants of right ventricular adaptation in individuals of otherwise similar pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, we have, I think, 108 participants right now um, with fairly extensive baseline phenotype. We've looked at demographics, diet, physical activity, sleep habits. We're collecting information on their echocardiograms, their cardiac MRIs, their right heart catheterizations, <laughs> cardiopulmonary exercise tests. We've established a biobank of blood samples for biologic correlates. We're gonna follow them for about two years with the idea that we'll understand who looks more like the adaptive phenotype that Stu Rich described and who looks more like the failure phenotype that Stu Rich described. Um, and then go back, try and understand the characteristics of those who adapted versus those who failed and begin the process of understanding how we might be able to move that dial. So, I hope that I've left you with the sense that research has already come a long way in pulmonary hypertension, but has a long way yet to go. I hope I've left you with the idea that further understanding in the already existing paradigms may improve the care of these patients, that pulmonary hypertension is not one disease, but many, and that improved targeting of our therapies by disease subtype 
and population may have benefits. That right heart afterload is the hallmark of pulmonary arterial hypertension and thinking about it in new ways and targeting it in new ways may pay dividends. And finally is that this is fundamentally a disease of right heart failure and finding a way to improve the strength and adaptation of the right heart may improve the care of these patients. So we just want to finish off uh, by our, our thank you slide. It's a little bit generic because there are a lot of people that um, are important. The patients who live with this disease every day and generously contribute at very high rates to any studies in pulmonary hypertension. This is not one disease, but many. And so lots of doctors take care of these patients. Internists, cardiologists, transplant surgeons, um, hepatologists, it's a gambit. Um, as well as the inpatient staff, nursing, respiratory, uh, pharmacy. And finally, and most of all, uh, somebody for whom our pulmonary hypertension clinic would not function uh, is Stephanie Nolly. <laughs> um, who really is tireless taking care of these patients. Um, the number of times uh, I hear about someone having called her on her personal cell phone uh, as she's trying to sort out their issues, she's an outstanding fund of knowledge in this disease and takes care of these patients at an extremely high level. Um, and I think that this clinic would be not nearly as functional without her. So. <laughs> <laughs>